Morning, everybody. Great to see all of you, Chuck. Thank you so much. You know I like that song, don't you? We're going to start out with last week's... Okay, this way, yeah. With last, week, last week's weekly Bible challenge, the question was, according to 1 John 5, what is the confidence we have in Christ? And the answer to that is, now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. And so... The answer to this is, if we have confidence in Christ, anything we ask, we know that God has heard us. Now, that doesn't always mean that God's going to do exactly as we ask, but we know that He's heard us, that He's considered it, and that He's working on a way to help us to, in, in whatever we ask Him to do. And so that's a great confidence that we have as Christians. We know that He hears us, and we have the petitions uh, that we've asked of Him. And so our next challenge for this coming week is this. In Matthew chapter 3, what two metaphors did John the Baptist use when warning the scribes and Pharisees about the coming judgment of Jesus? So Jesus has two metaphors he uses for the scribes and Pharisees who were coming to hear him speak in the wilderness. And the first thing he says is, well, what are you vipers doing here? Not exactly a nice welcome, but he knew that in their hearts they didn't have good intentions. And so he was warning them with two powerful metaphors. So look that up in Matthew chapter 3 and see if you can't find that answer. All right, so our uh, scripture reading today is from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You might be familiar with it. In fact... Uh, we had a class on it this morning that Jason did a great job talking about. And we didn't plan this. He just chose this particular verse. But this is one of the first times that a class and a sermon are going together at the same month. So that's kind of, you're going to get some of that today. So for those of you who are in the class, you might be going, well, didn't we talk a little bit about this? Yes, we did. But I wanted to start it off well because I think discipleship is this important that we, we focus on it this month. So let's read together. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 92% of people in the United States owns at least one Bible in their home. Now recognize that only about 80% or so call themselves Christians. There are people who have homes that don't consider themselves Christians, and yet they still have a Bible and their home. It's become in the United States such a commonplace thing to own a Bible that it's simply a part of a home. Anywhere you go just about in the United States where there's a hotel, what are you going to find if you open up a drawer? A Gideon Bible. They give out millions of copies a year to different places. And of those who own a Bible, that the average that people own is about nine, and that sounded high, but believe it or not, that's how many people, the average, the average household who has a Bible owns about nine, and they want more. Every year, every year in the United States, 20 million Bibles are sold. 20 million Bibles. It is by far the best-selling book anywhere. If you want to find a Bible in the U.S., it doesn't take much. And we're not even considering online applications and things you can find on the Bible. Biblical literacy, however, is at an all-time low. And it has been for several years. 
Only 20% only 20 of Americans say they've read through the entire Bible. Only 22% say they systematically read a portion of Scripture at a time each day. And fewer than half of all Americans say that the Bible is 100% accurate. So while most people own a Bible, while America is saturated in Bibles... The, the people who actually know the Bible and trust in the Bible are relatively low in comparison. And so if there was ever a time for us to have a biblical revolution, a return of studying the Bible, now was the time before the next generation quits studying altogether, which is, it would be easy for that to happen. And yet, how do you get people to dust off their Bibles and read them? This year, our theme is stay in the Word. And there's no better directive when it comes to biblical literacy than to do just that for the challenge we have today. As our memory verse for, for this month tells us, the command from Jesus is simple. Stay in the Word and go make disciples. If you want a good reason for staying in the Word... Beyond knowing truth for yourself, it is this. If we stay in the Word faithfully, we will go and make disciples. That's a guarantee. People who are not in the Word faithfully, for the, and you've got to realize for, the, for a good reason, just biblical knowledge is not enough, but to truly know and understand and practice the Word, those who are in the Word will make disciples. It won't be a choice for them. It will be a product of them staying in the Word. And so how do we accomplish that? How do we translate biblical study into making disciples of all nations as Jesus commanded? Well, one of the things we need to understand is that the Word commands authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. All authority from whom? From God. The, God the Father gave Jesus all authority. And with that authority, what did Jesus say to do? He says, go and make disciples. Meaning that I want you to go with my authority and make disciples of all nations. So it's not just that we're going and trying to tell people, oh, you need to believe, you need to believe. We carry the authority of Christ. And every time we open up the Word... We bring that authority into our lives. You know, in Jesus' time, authority was an interesting question because the authorities at the time were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. And, and they noticed something about Jesus. There was something different about Jesus. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But we have to understand that they listened to everything that the Pharisees and the Sadducees said. They thought, these guys are the authority. Now take today, it's a little different. Who's the authority today when it comes to matters of life? There is none. People only listen to themselves. Or they'll latch on to some kind of guru or person who who claims to have all the answers, and they'll try a million different things. If it's a diet, you know, there, how many diets are out there? I mean, could you even name the top ten? There's so many. Or when it comes to fitness and health, when it comes to science, when it comes to any number of subjects, all people have to do is get on the Internet for five minutes and they're an expert on everything, right? I mean, that's, that's the struggle, when you talk about authority, and so it has to be something more than just saying, listen to me, I'm talking about the Bible. There has to be something more behind what the Word gives a person that says, hey, wait a second, there's some authority behind what they're saying. When we're in God's Word daily, we carry Jesus' authority with us. It overflows into our daily lives. Matthew 7, 28-29 this is the end of the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. When, and it says, When Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at His teaching. Why were they astonished? For He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They knew that this was real. 
They knew that there was something about this that's different. See, if you go to a person and you're just talking to them on a, on a regular basis and you talk about God in the Bible, they've heard it before. They've heard about the Bible. They've heard about Jesus. Even people who have no interest in Jesus in this country know who Jesus is and know what the Bible is. They might not be able to, answer, to, to name the first five books of the Bible or of the New Testament. They might have very little understanding of the Bible, but they're familiar with it. But when you're in the Word and you're speaking from a place of authority that comes from God's Word working in you, people will notice the authority that is in you. That's the plan. That's the point. That's how you make disciples is when you carry Christ's authority in your words. You say, well, how does that happen? I don't know how it happens. I know that the Spirit of God works in us. I know that the Word of God works on us. I don't know exactly how Christ's authority works through us. I just know it does. And it works powerfully if we stay in the Word. Without the authority of the Word, we have no business making disciples. But with His authority, Jesus will speak through us. I've often heard people say, boy, if Jesus would just come back today, or if he could give us miracles that we could do, if only he were here. It's as if we're looking for someone else to fulfill all the things that we've been called to do. But you have to understand, if you're here on the earth and you're a Christian, Jesus is here. That's the point. Jesus is here because he carries his authority in your life. He carries His authority when you carry out His Word. That power, that authority is, is coming through you. All authority has been given to me. And therefore, where did the authority transfer? Where was it given? Because it's not like the authority just went, whoop, it's gone when Jesus was raised up to heaven. Instead, He gave the authority of the apostles to make disciples. And the apostles gave their disciples the same authority, the same call, the same power. So translated all the way down to today, who has the authority to make disciples today? We do. Because it's not our authority. It's His. Is it still Jesus' authority? Is it, does it still work in our lives? Is it still a part of what we say and do? If we stay in the Word, because later in this verse he says, teaching them things, them, the, the things that I commanded you. He wasn't just saying, you go and teach them something. He says, all the things that I commanded you, you teach them. Paul had authority even though he had never seen Jesus because Christ's authority came upon him when he took on the mantle of an apostle. And the Spirit of God and the Word of God worked in him. And now we have this Word, this complete Word, that we can go all over the world or just in Saginaw and give people Christ's authority speaking through us if we stay in the Word. And so, the Word commands authority. But how else do we make disciples? Because just... Reading the Bible isn't going to translate into discipleship. Well, the Word also creates an interest in others. An interest in Jesus uh, towards the people around us speaking to us. The, the idea of being a disciple is that you want to follow somebody, right? If you're a disciple of a certain thing, like Slim Fast or whatever, that's, that's the old school thing, you know, the, the keto diet. I did slim fast when I was kind of college-y, you know, because it was easy. I'd just drink a shake, you know. But all of those things, people, people get into that and they become almost a disciple of it, right? Have you tried this new product? It's the best thing in the world. You've got to try it. It works. It's great. I've lost 300 pounds doing this or whatever, you know. And people, they, they get these things, they get an idea of these things and they just promote it to everybody. And it's an excitement to them and it's wonderful to them. They create interest in something, right? Well, as Christians, our job is to create interest in Jesus Christ. It's not to teach them every little thing that they ever need to know because I don't know if I could do that for people. But it's to create in them an interest in Jesus Christ. And you'd be surprised where that comes from. 
Staying in the word creates an interest in Jesus and others because they're going to see you teaching them in various ways that you might not consider teaching. When you think about teachers in general, uh, we're talking about educational teachers. They, they have to get a degree in order to teach. And usually it's a four-year, maybe five-year. It, sometimes it's hard to get a four-year degree as a teacher, right? It takes five years sometimes, depending on what you're teaching. And then they have to do the free teaching, you know, that they don't get paid for. And then finally, it's almost like, like going through medical school, right? You, you gotta, you gotta, they got to make sure that you're not going to mess these kids up with the teaching. You know, you gotta, you got to be fully equipped. And, and it's a lot of work to do, and then the pay isn't all that great a lot of times. But they do it because they want to share what they have learned. They, they have a passion for teaching others something that's going to give them value and worth in life. They want to see young minds being shaped and formed. And it's hard to be a teacher in this day and age. It's difficult to take on that profession and spend a lot of money going to school for a job that sometimes is underappreciated by the people who are being taught. And I wonder... For us, how much preparation do we think we need to be teachers as Christians? How, how much work? And, and I'm not talking about going to a four-year college. I'm not talking about doing this and that, even though that's not a bad thing to do. I'm saying if we're going to teach others, if our job is to teach others, how much preparation do we do in order to teach others? How much study do we do? How much thought process? How much on-the-job training do we do? Is that a passion for us? Is it a desire? Because part of what makes us disciples of Jesus is a passion for learning about Jesus. But if that passion for learning is not in us, are we truly disciples of Christ? Are we just observers who say Jesus is pretty good, but I've learned all I want to about Him? Teachers have to continue to learn or they're left behind by the times. Christians need to continue to learn lest we no longer become relevant. 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 Relevance the word. Thank you. <laughs> to the people who are hearing us. To the people who need to hear it because they don't have a teacher. They don't have someone to show them what it means to follow Jesus. It is a call to faithfulness towards Jesus that we teach and create interest in Him to those around us. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, this is Paul wrapping up a lot of things he's talking about to Timothy. And he says, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, listen to this, who will be able to teach others also. When we baptize somebody in a church, are we making them teachers? Are we considering that part of their spiritual education is learning to be teachers? Because how do you, how do you continue to transmit God's Word throughout the generations? Do you simply teach people to follow Jesus or do you teach people to follow Jesus with the understanding that they're going to be able to teach others also? I would submit that if we're going to lead people to Jesus, we should create not only an interest in following Jesus and, and being baptized into Christ, which is a part of the Great Commission, but also that they can teach others. Because otherwise, what happens? What happens is you got 20 million Bibles being bought every year and half of them don't even believe in the word that they are, they're, they're investing in. That's what happens when we stop making teachers. And I'd submit that everyone here has something to teach to someone who has need to learn. If we have a passion for teaching others, we will see others influenced by our teaching. We just need to be willing to share in what we learn. If y'all have ever been around Riley for any amount of time, you're going to know that the guy has so much useless knowledge. And I might have already mentioned this, but he's such an easy target. And, and I owe him so much for all the things he's done to me over the years, you know, when I'm not here. 
But if you go on a nature hike with Riley, he will tell you everything about every flora and fauna that you see on the trail in detail. And you're probably thinking, you know, I don't think I really need to know this, but I'm glad that he has a knowledge about it. It's a good thing. He could be a nature expedition guy if he ever didn't do youth ministry. He could easily just take people on hikes all the time and fill them with, with trivial knowledge about random things. And, and I love it. Don't get me wrong, because I love talking about that stuff. But it's interesting because he just naturally teaches people the things that he's learned. Wouldn't it be a great thing if a part of being a Christian is that we just naturally teach people the things we've learned? When you're having a conversation with a friend or coworker, you say, you know, in this situation, I've always found this verse to be useful or, or I've always found my faith to help me in this particular situation. I remember a time when I was going through this and my faith really helped me to find perspective. Do you see what I mean? It should be so natural for us to talk about Christ and talk about God. But I think, and I could be wrong, but I think the reason that we don't is that we're not in the Word. Because if you're in the Word and engaged in the Word, you can't help but talk about it because it's what's on your mind and heart. And then you're a great teacher because you're going to share that knowledge with the people around you. But if you're always full of TV and the world and everything else that we, we partake in and the Word is not your main focus, that's what's going to come out. I promise you, every time that's what's going to come out in your life. But if you're in the Word, it can't be helped. You must Share it. And so the Word creates an interest in others. It commands authority. And the Word keeps Christ in our hearts. It is the heart that is the messenger when it comes to making disciples. What did Jesus say at the end of this verse? And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. What was He talking about? Well, he wasn't physically there with them, obviously. You say he could sort of spiritually be in them, but where would he reside? Where would you find Jesus? Today, if you were to say, where is Jesus? Funny story, since Jillian's not here. She's going to kill me for this. He could watch this on YouTube later. But when G Jillian was really little, uh, she asked a question. I think it was one of my siblings, and it kind of scared them a little bit. Jillian says, Where's Jesus? Because he's not in my heart. <laughs> and it was just a little kid thing to say, right? But you think about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And more than anything, when we talk about the heart, we talk about the seed of our emotions, we talk about the, the, the basic, this is who we are, this is how we feel, this is what we are. If Christ is in your heart... And if he remains in your heart, I promise you, you will make disciples. And the reason is that if Christ is on your heart and in your heart, your heart always expresses what it feels in some way. Your heart is always going to find a way to express itself. That's just human nature. We can't help but express our hearts in some way. And, if, and, if, and it is the heart that's the messenger when it comes to to making disciples in Christ. We think of the way Jesus intended for discipleship to happen, and what He does is He creates living examples of His love in the world. He creates living examples. And if you see any kind of commercial, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to get real customers that have done this program or lost this weight or have tried this out or tried that out and it'll say actual customer because when you see a commercial you think oh it's an actor they're not really they haven't really been changed but an actual witness someone who can say this is what I've done and this has been the results it's important for people to show this is the impact this is the effect we are the result of Christ's teaching we are the result of Christ's love. We are the result of the gospel that being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. We are evidence that we have been changed and transformed by the power of Christ. And so if our example and our evidence and our speech and the things we talk about do not scream Christ, we have failed the world. 
and we failed Christ. Because we're it. We're the product of Christ in the world. We're the best of the best. You say, well, I'm pretty bad. Look, you're a sinner, but Christ is in you. And if Christ is in you, then the world will see something different. And it's not just be a good example. You have to be vo 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 vocal. You have to show in your love and in the things that you do the love of Christ. But you will show it in some way if you stay in the Word and if the Word stays in your heart. When the Word is allowed into our hearts, we will be so passionate about it that we cannot help but make disciples of others. And Jason actually used this same verse in his class, again, unintended. Mark chapter 6, 33 30 through 34, when you had this huge crowd that was following Jesus, and it said, But when the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all cities, they arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them. Because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Why did Jesus teach the crowd? Because he was moved with compassion for them. Why do we make disciples of this world? Because we are moved with compassion for the lost. It's a simple, it's such a simple motivation. It's such a small little phrase, moved with compassion. Why do people become doctors and nurses? Because they're moved with compassion. Why do they become teachers? Because they're moved with compassion for kids and learning. Why do people become ambulance drivers or, or firefighters or any number of professions where you help people? Because they are moved with compassion for those who need them. Why are we here? Because we are moved with compassion through the love of Jesus Christ on our own hearts. And if we are moved with compassion, then we need to go make disciples. And that means listening to His Word in our hearts. If we are moved by His Word, we can move others too. That's how discipleship works. You know, what it takes to be disciples is the same thing that it takes to make disciples. In China right now, and we just talked about it with our trip, people are being quarantined because of the coronavirus. And at first when it happened, China tried to suppress all knowledge of it, all talk about it, even uh, basically silencing a doctor who might have prevented some of the spread of it, and he ended up dying of the virus himself. And you see that suppression of knowledge in China a lot. That they, they have been trying to suppress Christianity for years. That they try to run out underground churches and arrest church leaders. And they just, recent, not too long ago, they destroyed a church building and, and, and sectioned it off and said, you're not going to meet here anymore. They're trying to suppress the gospel of Jesus. But I, I'm here to tell you, People have been trying to do that for 2,000 years. But do you know the only thing that will suppress the gospel is when we stop talking. When we stop sharing. And when we stop loving the lost. The Word of God cannot be suppressed. The power of Christ lives today. You see it everywhere in this country, all over our bookstores, in everybody's houses. All people need is someone to introduce them to the true knowledge of Christ that resides within. The question is, are we willing to do the work to stay in the Word and let God's Word motivate us to preach the Gospel? If you've struggled with that, or you need to obey the gospel yourself, do so now as together we stand and sing.